currently carrying out food research on how food and memory um, on food and on kind of food and memory for my PhD. But as a side project, I'm also looking at how the Gothic genre uses food as a signifier for change and how food is often more and more connected to fear and anxiety, revealing what lies beneath the surface of cultural and social propriety. So then we'll be looking at some Gothic literature in a minute. I will be starting by talking about some of the food tropes and symbols that I noticed in horror films, as this is the starting point for some of my considerations when it comes to Gothic texts such as Frankenstein and Dracula. Um, so we'll be talking a little bit about um, food as a symbol, the meaning of horror and food and supernatural, sorry, the meaning of food in horror and supernatural films, and depictions of food in Gothic texts such as Frankenstein, Dracula, Rebecca, The Haunting of Hill House, and Rosemary's Baby. And as well as the act of eating, I'll talk a bit about the places we eat in and source our food from as well. <clears throat> so the starting point for my research was from observations on how food is portrayed in film, where it often expresses a set of anxieties by acting as a signifier of change, frequently within the family setting. So it started to interest me that food and the act of eating was tied to a series of other meanings of signifiers that aimed at making the person watching feel uneasy. Normally food had the opposite objective, uh, bonding, you know, sitting around a table, holding hands, um, a moment of union between families and friends, definitely in my family. <laughs> Take pizza, for instance. Um, so, you know, why did pizza suddenly become a portal for the devil or evil to enter into our world? So we can see some examples here in, for example, the house of the devil or lights out. Um, or Annabelle. You know, I began to notice that there was a, an association, let's say, between an idea of disintegration of communication within the family and the community and a visual representation of a lack of food preparation or care for food as a communal experience. So as a symbol, the meaning of pizza had started to evolve into something different and um, how it was being used was geared towards creating a sense of unease at first and then fear with the appearance or manifestation of the supernatural entity. Uh, though we all have to eat, there is an uncanniness that goes hand in hand with eating, precisely because it is part of our everyday. So what is outside of our bodies before it enters our body is not us. And so there is an unavoidable otherness when it comes to eating that exemplifies the uncanny. <clears throat> so the uncanny is defined by Freud as that which is strange in the ordinary. And um, in this context, the uncanny arises from the realization that there is something odd happening in perhaps the most vital of the activities that we carry out to stay alive, which is eating. So we engage with the outside world by placing parts of it inside of ourselves through our mouths. And for this not to feel odd, you know, there are certain rules that we need to follow. So for us to comprehend why finding, say, a tooth in our food isn't ideal, but even worse than that, perhaps, and I, you know, we would need to already have an idea of boundaries, of an idea of what's right and what's wrong when it comes to the food rules that we follow socially. Um, the rules and boundaries that give food a meaning is what British anthropologist Mary Douglas wrote about. So she, she states that the ingestion of food is also the consumption of a system of meanings. So she even talks of meal systems that take place over a whole life cycle, from the christening cake to the wedding cake, to the funeral baked meats. Um, now we may or may not have eaten any of those, but you know, we get the idea. And Roland Barthes as well, a French theorist, also famously stated that food is a system of communication, a body of images, a protocol of usages, situations and behavior. But the communication and symbology of those items of consumption depend on the cultural context. For instance, coffee as a symbol considered a stimulant for the nervous system is now associated with relaxation, which contrasts with its original function. So categories of meaning can overlap depending on the cultural context. So if food is a signifier, it will also perhaps represent and symbolize what is dangerous within a community and within a society. For instance, though a cake might normally symbolize a moment of celebration, um, perhaps a moment which people might look forward to, in Get Out, for instance, we see how the tension at the dinner table is heightened by the uncanniness of Georgina already standing behind the kitchen door 
holding the cake incredibly still as the door swings open. And at other times, there is a more explicit symbology occurring, as we can see in the possession where, for example, Emily is vegetarian, but after she becomes possessed, she manifests a preference for eating directly from the fridge. And um, as we can see, is eating raw meat. So again, going back to what Douglas and Barthes have said about food as a symbol and a system of communication, though certainly it's not impossible to eat raw meat, we understand that in this context, and especially because at the start of the film, it shows her as campaigning for animal rights. You know, we know that something isn't quite right. So she has, in fact, been possessed and food rules have been broken. So I noticed how um, that food or items of consumption framed supernatural events. Manifestations of evil always occurred either before or after some sort of food imagery. Here we have some examples with milk. You know, now milk is normally associated with purity and um, innocence and nutrition, growth. So it's interesting that it's so often used as a symbol closely associated to bad events taking place within these films. So, and I have endless examples of something bad happening as people open fridges, you know, which I have not included in this presentation. <laughs> I had to cut down on slides. So the question is, why is food a vehicle for manifestations of evil or supernatural occurrences? Um, I think we are increasingly worried about food, about what it contains, is what is written on the label actually what it contains, or are there hidden ingredients? What guarantee do I have that this meat is beef and not horse meat, um, or vice versa, for example? And I think we're truly weighed down by a pressure that derives from a social responsibility to do what's right when it comes to food. So how we source it, is it organic, is it healthy, is it unhealthy? You know, the fact that food is channeling the supernatural changes that occur in horror films indicates possibly that there is an anxiety attached to this pressure. So the way we consume has changed with capitalism in Western terms, and with it there have been cultural changes that have seen an overlap between fear and food as spheres that intersect. As Jane Brigson, an English cookery writer, notes in 1979, present-day dangers are no longer as visible as they used to be. So drawing a comparison with the past, she comments on food often being poisoned by unscrupulous purveyors, sand in the sugar, dried hawthorn leaves in the tea, and water in the milk. But at least this was recognized as a vicious thing to do. She states that food is now knowingly adulterated and spoiled in ways that are entirely legal. So there is some anxiety over definitions regarding food we may buy, for example, the word natural. So food labeled natural according to the USDA definition, does not contain artificial ingredients or preservatives, and the ingredients should be only minimally processed. However, they may contain antibiotics, they may contain growth hormones and other similar chemicals. So regulations are fairly lenient for foods labeled as natural. Also these foods labeled traditional or artisanal, you know, they evoke the idea of a small scale craft food making, but in fact, they are pr processed in large factories. So we have, perhaps we have the illusion of all this choice, but, as consumers, we're actually very vulnerable. Food shops, supermarkets are where we source our food and in horror films as well, we see how they are often portrayed as a site where people take refuge, but also as a site where danger and evil can manifest itself. So food, so we see here, for example, uh, in horror films such as Bird Box or Bait, you know, supermarkets becoming the location of danger. Um, Food as a message can become a space of protest and distrust. And I believe that because of how the evil manifests itself in so many of these films nowadays, there is an anxiety attached to what and how we consume that's being repeatedly expressed in this way. So there's a lot going on basically when it comes to the meaning of food. And with that in mind, when I reread some Gothic literature, I was able to notice some food rules or patterns of consumption that I hadn't noticed before. So um, if everything's okay, Sam, I'll move on to the lit literature part and um, exemplify this. So one of the first Gothic texts in which it's possible to observe how food acts as a symbol for what is other in the context of societal change is Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. The late 18th century was a period of time where the modalities of food production were changing and where the Industrial Revolution had begun transforming economies that had previously been based on agriculture and handicrafts into economies based on large-scale industry, mechanized manufacturing and factory system. 
So with the Romantics, we have a return to favoring um, perhaps a closer communion to nature, with nature and Romantic radicalism actually provided the context for the vegetarianism to which Mary Shelley was exposed to while growing up. So most of the Romantic vegetarians saw the French Revolution as an opportunity to reform the world, along with eliminating meat eating. So the first British book of this time to champion vegetarianism was John Oswald's The Cry of Nature, or An Appeal to Mercy and to Justice on Behalf of the Persecuted Animals. A short title, so, uh, published in 1791. And he actually died in France in 1793, fighting for the Jacobins during the French Revolution. And I think the first vegetarian cookbook was also published around this time. So it, in the words of Percy Shelley, it is only the wealthy that can, to any great degree, even now, indulge the unnatural craving for dead flesh, as he writes in A Vindication of Natural Diets. The scholarship hasn't um, overly focused on Frank the Frankenstein creature's vegetarianism, but generally the idea is that Frankenstein's monster being vegetarian symbolically stands for an original benevolence. Um, so the creature includes animals within its moral codes, but is obstructed and violently frustrated when attempting to gain inclusion within the moral codes of humanity. So it proposes the creation of a companion so that it need no longer seek inclusion in, into human society. It is at this point that it announces the dietary principles and those that its companion will follow when they accept self-imposed exile to South America. And he says, my food is not that of man. I do not destroy the lamb and the kid to glut my appetite. Acorns and berries afford me sufficient nourishment. My companion will be of the same nature as myself and will be content with the same fare. So we shall make our bed of dried leaves. The sun will shine on us as on man and will ripen our food. The picture I present to you is peaceful and human. So vegetarianism is one way that the creature marks the difference and separation from its creator by placing the emphasis on its more inclusive moral code. And its vegetarianism also serves to make it a more sympathetic being one who considers how humans exploit others. So by including animals within its moral world, the creature provides a symbol for what it hoped for and needed, but didn't receive from human society. So there's a humanization through food of Frankenstein's being. He is monstrous in the Latin sense of the word, which means to show. And what's he showing us? Perhaps that he isn't a born killer and his murders are the consequence of a lack of nurture and his innocence is proved or made evident by his food choices. Interestingly, the monster decides to eat fruit and nuts in order to spare the family he observes in the wilderness from hunger, as he recognizes that he is not equal to man and therefore doesn't deserve to eat better foods, i.e. other animals. Um, thus, a discrepancy is created between who is the most human between both, the creator who brings to life a being who didn't ask to be brought to life and abandons him, or a monster who though cast aside, is able to sacrifice himself by eating foods that nourish him less in order to comply with the social rules that see him subjugated to a society that has both created him and cast him aside. Um, in his revenge, Frankenstein's being is rebelling to an unjust society by eating just roots and vegetables. So interestingly, Victor Frankenstein, in constructing his creature, goes to the slaughterhouse as well as the graveyard he says the dissecting room and the slaughterhouse furnished many of my materials and often did my nature turn with loathing from my occupation. So that Victor goes to slaughterhouses could imply that the creature was herbivorous since um, I think humans eat mostly herbivorous animals. Um, the pieces of the body gathered by Victor from the slaughterhouse would have been parts from herbivorous beings. So that would mean that at, at least a portion of the creature was anatomically vegetarian. While the women in Frankenstein fulfill feminine roles and die as a result, um, the men represent inflexible masculine roles. Um, it's the new being, so it's Frankenstein's creature who represents the complete critique of the present order. And in this sense, the creature embodies both vegetarian and feminist meaning. Um, just like the role food has in Frankenstein is a bit on the margins, or let's say an absent trace, I feel it's close perhaps to how Mary Shelley's feelings would have been about the role of women as non-entities within the male discourse. Um, in describing the events that led up to the completion of Frankenstein in the 1831 edition, 
Mary Shelley creates an image of herself as absent in the role of the listener. She states that many and long were the conversations between Lord Byron and Shelley, to which I was a devout but nearly silent listener. <laughs> um, so, yeah, leading on um, from humanity versus monstrosity, uh, the next novel I chose was Dracula. Um, so Dracula actually starts off with references to food from the very first pages. And as Jonathan Harker moves further and further away from the West, towards the East and into the territories of the former Ottoman Empire, we see too how the food gets more pungent, wilder, and strangeness starts turning into superstition. Before he reaches Dracula's castle, he's eating meals on a regular basis, actually, as we can see from his supper, his breakfast and dinners, which Harker takes the time to describe, you know. So we're able to see him eat normally with a consistency in the frequency and structure of his meals, but this local cuisine is providing him with large amounts of garlic. But Harker has no idea of the significance at this stage. By the time Harker arrives at the castle and is greeted by Count Dracula, he is already extremely scared. He has been prepared by the food, causing him strange dreams, a strangeness of origin attached to and initially generated by the food. So Dracula was written in 1897 and during the late 19th century, exported goods from the colonies became widely available to purchase in Britain. So in the parallel Gothic literary scene, vampires became a symbol of the transformation that reflected these changes happening in the world. Bram Stoker's Dracula is an example of the fear of the unknown and of the other, and could be parallel to the new products that were being imported in due to Britain's expansion as a colonial power. So as Gothic monsters, um, they are essentially characterized by the idea of transformation and insatiable hunger, and Stoker interlaces the deepest instincts and fears about identity through hunger and food to create this monstrous picture of otherness. <clears throat> Food-wise, a sense of danger is conveyed by the transition from availability of food before Harker reaches the castle and unavailability of food in Dracula's castle. So there is mention of some cold food that Jonathan eats alone, obviously. Um, cold breakfasts are laid out and they become less and less descriptive though as his stay in the castle continues. And though Dracula does make sure to have the gold table service. And of course, he thoroughly enjoys the flourish of taking the cover of the dish off the cold cuts himself because for Harker. And this excessive formality also contributes to a sense of, let's say, uneasiness, as it feels as though the gesture is due to an overcompensation because of the lack of more adequate food. And um, this formality, but displayed within the context of hierarchy, is really very visible in Rebecca um, by Daphne de Maurier. I, uh, the world of Rebecca is one of absolutely inflexible social hierarchies with the theme of food acting as a pivot upon which social distinctions are made. So throughout the novel, characters eat according to who they are and where they stand in the class system. So in the opening pages, unnamed heroine, we have to call her unnamed heroine, which is really annoying, unnamed heroine, or maybe second Mrs. De Winter, employer Mrs. Van Hopper enjoys some fresh ravioli while unnamed heroine is reduced to eating cold meat. So she says, Mrs. Van Hopper, her fat bejeweled fingers questing a plate heaped high with ravioli, her eyes darting suspiciously from her plate to mine for fear that I should have made the better choice. She need not have disturbed herself for the waiter with the uncanny swiftness of his kind had long sensed my position as inferior and subservient to hers, and had placed before me a plate of ham and tongue that somebody had sent back to the cold buffet half an hour before as badly carved. <clears throat> so um, once she becomes the second Mrs. De Winter, this hierarchical attitude manifested through food will also be echoed by how Mrs. Danvers, the head housekeeper at Manderley, treats her and approaches her daily with a selection of menus that she needs to choose from as lady of the house. But she never has the courage to do this and to make her own individual choices and always ends up choosing what Rebecca would have chosen according to Mrs. Danvers' suggestions. So later on in the novel, Mrs. De Winter will reject cold food and leftovers as a daily lunch in Manderley. 
Her insistence upon a hot lunch from the servants is, from her point of view, a triumph and a symbol of her status as the Mrs. de Winter. She says, it was going to be very different in the future. I was not going to be nervous and shy with the servants anymore. I would go and interview the cook in the kitchen. They would like me, respect me. Soon it would be as though Mrs. Danvers had never had command. I think Manderley in flames at the end kind of signifies the end of an era. So when our heroine of inferior class starts giving orders to people who aren't actually below her social standing, she exerts her authority within the same sphere in which she feels she has been humiliated, so through food. And often there are houses burning at the end of novels like this, because really, you know, the house's size and requirements is what makes it necessary to have so many servants. So there is a need to metaphorically kill off an aristocratic past, which goes hand in hand with the destruction of the house itself. At least that is what I think. Um, then from one rebellious house to another one, um, I love the haunting of Hill House. The haunting of Hill House follows four strangers, all of whom come to Hill House, long rumored to be haunted, under the guidance of Dr. Montague, who's hoping to scientifically prove the existence of the supernatural. Uh, over the course of the summer, the house proves itself to be extremely haunted, and how it does so is also expressed through the way in which consumption occurs, of course. Um, my focus here was mainly on Mrs. Dudley, the housekeeper of Hill House, a really fascinating character who we mainly find in the kitchen, either cooking or preparing things. Now, Mrs. Dudley repeats on many occasions that she leaves the house before it gets dark. In fact, she doesn't stay after she sets out dinner. Theodora and Eleanor pick up a certain nervousness attached to Mrs. Dudley when it comes to the house and the fact that they need to respect the timing surrounding meals. They also notice that there are an odd number of doors in the kitchen, gesturing to the fact that Mrs. Dudley might need multiple escape routes for some reason. They say, Eleanor says, our good Mrs. Dudley likes doors, doesn't she? She can certainly get out fast in any direction if she wants to. I wonder if she had Dudley cut extra doors for her. I wonder how she likes working in a kitchen where a door in back of her might open without her knowing it. I wonder actually just what Mrs. Dudley is in the habit of meeting in her kitchen so that she wants to make sure that she'll find a way out no matter what direction she runs. Now there are a few references um, to how Mrs. Dudley may or may not be working for Dracula throughout the book and Theodora and Eleanor discuss whether Mrs. Dudley is actually watching over them for Dracula who might be located in the house since they have noticed bats in the house itself. So at one point, Theodora herself starts feeling as if she were walking up the walls, which leads back to this Dracula imagery. We start to get the feeling that perhaps Mrs. Dudley is feeding them so that they can then be fed to the house. So food and its mechanical timings are used to lull the guests into a false sense of security. So there's a robotic quality to the way in which Mrs. Dudley cooks, alerts them to their food being ready, makes some coffees and snacks, so her announcements regarding food nearly have a hypnotic quality in the sense that she repeats the same things over and over again. She'll say things like, I have breakfast ready for you at nine. That's the way I agreed to do it. You know, with an emphasis on the fact that she doesn't wait on the people, but one gets the feeling that she is in some way serving the house and how she keeps them alive through keeping them fed. And she does this constantly through feasts that are described as magnificent and her cooking skills are commented on all as being excellent. So a little bit like in perhaps Hansel and Gressel where they are being fattened up by the house in a sense so that they can let in something monstrous. Dr. Montague says at one point, commenting on Mrs. Dudley's wonderful feasts, I congratulate myself. I have led you to civilization through the uncharted wastes of Hill House. So the doctor is implying that food is what makes them human. When in fact, the narrative suggests what the narrative suggests is that it's leading them closer and closer to danger. The food tricks them uh, as it's always so incredibly tasty, but when the guests notice their own feelings when it comes to identifying, you know, what this haunting entity wants from them, they note that it is looking to consume us, to take us into itself, to make us part of the house, maybe. Oh dear, <laughs> says Eleanor. And Eleanor also does mention that she feels like a small creature swallowed whole by a monster. She says, the monster feels my tiny little movements inside. 
so you know we see the house presented as a perhaps a maternal space that regenerates itself through these guests who are being themselves fed within its walls um, within its belly you know possibly or body um, and this leads on to my last the last novel i'll be talking about to maternity of a special kind um, we have rosemary's baby it gives me the opportunity to discuss also issues issues of trust and food so the food the book centers on rosemary woodhouse which who's a young married woman who's just moved into a new york city apartment building with her husband guy a struggling actor rosemary and guy have um, a picnic of tuna sandwiches and a beer in their new apartment, you know, and an initial air of normality is established in this way. Their neighbour Minnie makes frequent appearances with food and drink, for instance, chocolate mousse. And we begin to gain some more insight into Rosemary and Guy's relationship from this point on. So Rosemary complains that her mousse has a chalky undertaste and only has two spoonfuls. Guy makes a scene and basically forces her to finish it. So with Guy's insistence, we can really see that the relationship between them isn't a very healthy one. In fact, Rosemary asks the question, referring to Guy, who we've said is an, is an actor, could anyone know when an actor was true and not acting? And this sets a tone for the food scenes too, in which she realises that she cannot trust the food that she's being given. She realises that she's being poisoned within the walls of her own home. The same night she eats a moose, Rosemary has a dream that she's being raped by something unhuman, following which she starts to eat glutton's meals, man-sized cans of beef stew and other meats, even rare meat. So when Rosemary discovers she's pregnant, Minnie is one of the first people to congratulate her. And it's decided that all the grocery shopping will be done for her, indicating that the points of entrance in terms of controlling Rosemary are mainly through consumption. So during her pregnancy, Rosemary becomes uncivilized herself in her consumption of meat in a way that isn't culturally acceptable, but this is because Rosemary's body itself is a meal for the child that she's carrying, or rather the Antichrist. <laughs> so we have this sense of sacrifice, which is particularly difficult to read about because Rosemary has no idea for most part of what is really going on. Once she does, and she uses those same methods to gain her freedom, she breaks free by poisoning the food and coffee of the person watching over her once she has given birth, but it's already too late. Um, so in conclusion, I think um, food can act as a secret subtext that could open the door of, in the, yeah, door of interpretation a little bit wider when it comes to reading Gothic texts and or watching horror even. Um, and I hope you enjoyed this talk. I'll stop sharing. Oh. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I muted and unmuted myself several times then. Um, yeah, fascinating. Thank you so much, Ellie. Um, You're so very welcome. Do people have questions they want to ask um, about this or any other book or film you want Ellie to do a, an off the cuff food reading of for you? <laughs> Yes, Frank, I did. I did choose the best covers and that's in honour of our book club and of Sam. <laughs> There's so many to choose from, but I feel like the Frankenstein one particularly was bang on. <laughs> yeah, I'm seeing some people typing, so I think... Yeah, that. pregnancy is cannibalism, yes, definitely from the inside. Mm. Oh, thank you. Julia Christen uses a skin of a warmed milk as one of her earliest examples of objection. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Visteva, yeah. Yeah, so this idea of kind of what's outside of us and what's inside and the relationship that we have with that, you know, is, is very complicated. And we think that eating is perfectly normal. We do it so often, but actually, you know, it is placing external things inside of us. And in some ways we have to accept that. And um, we do that through a social structure. So. That's why my initial analysis does starts with starts with some anthropology because just in order to get some you know rules in place because um, we don't put absolutely everything in our mouths so you know there must be a reason a reason why um, and we're often judged on that as well you know depending on what we eat so I find that really interesting and it's as I say for me like a secret subtext in the sense that also in Frankenstein like there's not much 
um, talk about why, you know, Frankenstein's creature eats what he does eat. But it's, for me, it's so um, clear and it signifies a lot. But it's obviously food is kind of the last thing that, it's, it's more treated like a prop, perhaps. Does that make sense? Mm. Um, just, to, yeah, something extra to kind of describe the character, but it doesn't have, for me, it's a real um, language, if that makes sense. Do you have any data about the author's research about food, or was it only their image of their time? Um, so research about food. Yes, I do. I mean, I have so many stories of me going up to authors. I mean, obviously the ones I've chosen now possibly they're not alive anymore. But for example, I went up to Sarah Waters one day. I used to happen to be in a theatre with her and I just said, I've got to do this. You know, I have an opportunity. Obviously, she's written some of my favourite books like Little Stranger or The Fingersmith and all of these. And I've always noticed the food in them. So I go up to her and I say, Sarah, um, I do, I'm doing research on food and the Gothic and, 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 you know, I just wondered how you go about sourcing what you do when it comes to food. And she looked at me really blankly and she said, I don't know. I, I don't know how I use food. I just don't, you know, I just pop something in there when I, <laughs> so she was really kind of not, um, in any way had not planned any of her food scenes. And I found that really incredible. So it's really part of people's subconscious. So I found, and that's when I started really looking into it because I thought this is like a secret language that people use. <laughs> she did mention that the most food that she'd used was in her book, The Paying Guests, um, because they do like big roast dinners and stuff. But actually she kind of hadn't noticed that she uses food a lot throughout her other novels. So I found that really fascinating. Yeah. Think about disordered eating, like Pika. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, there's a new film out here as well that um, I haven't watched yet called Swallow. So it's about eating foreign objects and things that you shouldn't, shouldn't in theory, shouldn't be eating, you know, things that can't be digested properly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See if there's anything else. Cannibalism, I had to throw some cannibalism in there, but not too much because it's quite early. <laughs> but how, how early on can I talk about the devil, you know? Oh, any sign. Quite, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see from Mason. Hannibal is introduced by a beautiful tableau of fruit and meat. Yes, panning up to this creepily lit skull like face chewing in the dark, Mason says. Yeah, so these scenes kind of introducing characters with um, big spreads on a table, fresh fruit and, and meat, you know, just indicating that everything's okay kind of thing, you know, the symbology of um, if there's food and it's fresh, then the character must be good. Um, when in actual fact, you know, there's a lot going on beneath that and people can use it as um, a kind of um, a screen to, to hide uh, darker stuff. Mm. Ice chewing is like an indication of anemia. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Yeah, I think ice, Oh, wait, I have some books I wanted to show you. So there's this one. So she's called Margaret Visser. I'll put it in my references. She um, is called Much Depends on, on Dinner. And she, I think she talks a lot about ice and the symbology of that and um, things like salt and why we need salt. So there, biologically, there are foods that we need to eat and they've been attached to um, a symbology but this is also a symbology that's often overturned as I mentioned with the coffee you know we might associate coffee to oh I need to wake up but it's also a moment of relaxation so this so food really is so layered and it can give out multiple messages messages at the same time and especially in the context of film and literature this is very useful because you can engage the reader or, or, the, or the person watching the film on many many different levels and you can also imagine yourself eating something and perhaps even salivating and you're in that way participating to a form of uh, you know you might feel guilty if it turns out that this character that you're you know salivating <laughs> with after you watch him um, or her eating something you know, it turns out to be an evil character. You're like, oh, I actually in some way bonded with this person over um, this um, crunchy apple that they're eating. And it's kind of creating in me a sense of, um, of hunger. Um, there's a child. Oh, interesting about this ice. Yes, a lot of food in Virginia Woolf. Yes, yes. I don't know if they, if it, you know, it's, it's hard to know 
was it their intention to ever use it so explicitly to signify something? My, my idea from what I've noticed and from interviewing various people and writers is no, not a clue, not at all. If they use it knowingly, then it kind of comes, comes across and you notice and it's a little bit at times forced. Mm -hmm. So no, I can't say, made you the hungriest while watching. Oh, oh, you know, have you ever seen this a film, uh, Babette's Feast by Karen Blixen? No. Okay, Babette's Feast, you must watch this, this is great. Yes, made me very hungry, though she does at some point cook a turtle, so I don't participate in that, but the rest of it is good. I feel like the thing that- Absolutely, it's unconsciously, yeah. Yeah, the thing that we share is those, um, the, what are they called? The red, red wall food stuff. Oh yes, we do, oh, that's brilliant, <laughs> really, really. It not just comes as a sense of, you know, oh, I feel hungry after this because it's a description of a cheese or something, but also that sense of um, kind of bonding with other people. And we all sit around and we share, you know, something together. So that's kind of always been what's behind the idea of food. Whereas now food, you know, we quite often eat alone. We don't use food to bond. You know, we're just using food to eat it to fill ourselves. So the, the idea behind food is, has changed. And um, I think that contributes to this sense of anxiety a little bit. Yeah, Red Wolf Feast, that's it. I yes, to... The Bet's Feast is such a great film and, and just a wonderful story. One of my favorite. Lots of raw meat, yeah. Oh, on the topic of raw meat. I'll also put this in. So this is a great book about the symbology of meat. It's by someone called Nick, I think Fiddes or Fids, put it in here. It's just called Meat. <laughs> um, and if you want, yes, some more detailed kind of insight into why, why raw meat is, you know, it's, well, we eat raw meat as well, but it's not your usual dish. So um, it might signify something slightly different. So yeah, that book is great, meat, yeah. Yes, the prepared foods. So the processed foods, this was all the slides, Mason, that I, I then took out. I had 85 slides um, on how food, um, the, you know, various packaging, and because I find it so interesting, there's this real connection between, especially single parent families, normally a woman with the kids, not suddenly losing the capacity to cook um, and then the appearance of the supernatural or evil entity. So I think you have this as well, you know, this single parent family in The Exorcist and in many, 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 many horror films. I mean, these horror films that I've talked about are only, I could have picked another 50 just like that. Like there's no, there, it's all the same. So suddenly they're just opening tins into bowls, literally, they're just emptying packets, they're just, you know, eating crisps like this, like there's no cooking. Um, and this signifies like a lack of bonding between family members. And this means that there's weakness in these films and that gives the entity kind of a, a channel, a portal to come through. Um, but at the same time, I think this is kind of in the subconscious of people that it, it indicates some sort of anxiety that we have with food. Um, and that's why I find it interesting. Yes, very divorced from its source. The same thing that I wanted to try and, and highlight with the supermarkets. You know, we go to these places and we just pick up packets of stuff. We have no connection to the direct source of these, of what's in, in these packages, you know. This is not our fault. I'm just saying, you know, there's a sense of unease, which is why I think so many films also have these images of people uh, wandering about in supermarkets. And I think in Bird Box, John Malcolm, um, What's the name? I can't remember the name of the character, but one of the, the main ones says something like, let's just sleep here. We have all we need here in the supermarket. So, you know, in an aisle, they can just set up. And, um, but then also there is danger in that same supermarket that tries to attack them. So it's very interesting that they're trapped in the same space in which they are trying to get their nourishment. And I think we feel that as a community and as a society, that sometimes we don't fully know what's going on. Yes, fairies use people to bind them. It's the point of entry, isn't it, to humanity. Um, so they mimic. There are lots of films like The Hole in the Ground as well. So the, the evil entity is mimicking being human through food, but they can't do it properly. They can't regulate um, 
the amount of humanity that they want to show. So it comes across as not being um, natural. Um, so that's quite interesting to watch as well. You get that in the possession as well. So this uncontrollable eating, the, the speed at which the, they eat, you know, all of that indicates that they're possessed because they're not behaving as normal humans would, which is not to kind of grab everything and eat with your hands. So you get that a lot in films like this as well. Yeah, become worms and maggots history, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hercules breaks the rules of hospitality of bread and salt after being cursed, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The religious associations, yes. Oh, a lot of that. If you think of like a Catholic religion, we're eating the body of Christ, and you know, it all depends what perspective you see things in, um, what the perspective is. And there's this loss of like trust towards religion as well that we see with all these films about cults, about the devil. Um, and again, food is a big entry point in that. So we trust our neighbors because we share meals with them. Actually, they're poisoning us, you know. Um, Lost boys, I haven't eaten that. So I think yes, and such maggots. Yeah. Yeah. Very nutritious maggots, by the way. Worms, very nutritious and eaten in cultures, you know, for a very good source of protein. So it all also depends on how you're looking at it. But there's this Western imagery, obviously, of insects and not something that we would normally eat, for sure. Very, yeah. I mean, I've never, I did try to eat. Uh, grasshopper once because it was on uh, in this Mexican restaurant that I was working with uh, very hard um, and some Mexican in some Mexican cuisines now in the restaurants you know they are trying to glam this up a bit so they will spray the insects with gold and then put them on the guacamole but it still doesn't you know there's it still doesn't fit with my eye so there's something very specific there about culturally what you grow up with what you're used to um, some people may feel like that with fish or eating the eyes of fish and some other cultures are absolutely fine with that, you know, so, and yeah, very salty apparently. And we need salt to, there are parts of our brain that need to develop, that can only develop because we have enough salt and enough minerals and certain things that we need. Yeah, oh, Mason. <laughs> How many worms, I wonder how many worms they'd eat, what the record was for that. Oh, I don't know. 101 ways to eat fried worms. <laughs> My goodness, that must have been thousands then. It's not weird, but yeah. I find it hard to see it visually as well, you know, when you see it in, in, in films. <laughs> I mean, obviously, in your PhD work, you work yeah. on Latin American fiction and specifically Cuban yes. writers, Cuban American writers. Um, and I wondered, like, do you see a lot of difference between um, different cultural contexts um, in terms of how food, are, food is used? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I specifically work on cultural memory and food. So the Gothic is kind of something a little bit separate that I'm doing at the moment, but that really ties in, I've seen that really ties in well with the imagery and the idea of sometimes scarcity of food. You know, in, um, in Cuba, for instance, I deal with the situation of the embargo and how that's portrayed in Cuban American literature and in Cuban literature. You know, so um, often food is idealized, um, but it's idealized more and more where there is an actual lack of food. Um, so that in itself is, is quite horrific and I think is what I'm trying to tie in with this idea of, um, of horror. Um, you know, not horror, horror, food in, in horror, you know, we can interpret it in different ways, but there are food situations that are truly horrific and are so still today. So um, what I'm trying to do with my PhD is highlight how that is portrayed via literature, you know, in a diasporic context as well especially where people are moving from Cuba to the US and in the US they find that there is an abundance of food compared to where they've come from where they are still being rationed you know after 60 years this is a reality you know so for me it was important to highlight that aspect but um but as a tangent a massive tangent I'm also doing the gothic yeah yeah famous five yeah yeah 
all those picnics they 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 go don't they they egg sandwiches yeah (laughs) yeah and also a lot of the narnia books you know food with children is very important so when yeah the white queen kind of captures edmund through the turkish delight doesn't she he it's seen as a point of corruption you can corrupt someone with someone something sweet and that's because of the idea we have of what that sweet things means in that context or um there's a more wholesome type of food and that will that will that will symbolize honesty and bravery you know even but we don't even notice I, i'm really convinced we don't even notice it it's really in the subtext yeah in the hobbit yeah and then lots of like um fruit supper club well they used to be you know before covid um these supper clubs where there's food themed parties and dinner parties so you'll get like the hobbit thing and theme and um whatever yeah from home yeah jam yeah definitely so many slides I've taken out about jam, Dan, don't remind me. <laughs> this packet, there's one scene in, I'll tell you, there's one scene in The Boy, which isn't actually supernatural, because in the, well, I won't give too much away. Anyway, there's an entity, there's whatever. And um, so this person that's come to look after this, this boy that actually turns out to be a doll, and they have meals together, and it's really weird, you know. And then from that moment on that she realizes how weird it is, because actually they're making her eat with a doll, she takes out jam from her suitcase and that's the only thing she will eat throughout the rest of the film she just makes jam and peanut butter sandwiches and i find that really interesting it's like there is a separation between like i'm not going to communicate anymore with these people these weird people um who want me to do something weird i'm going to eat my own packaged stuff that i've taken out of my own bag because i know the origin and i know the source yeah um, somebody asked it uh, further up, have you read Under the Pendulum Sun yet, Ali? Yes, lots of, and I had the opportunity to talk to the author, it was incredible, and she said that she was very much inspired by, I think, um, Regency type food because her boyfriend was in catering at the time, so she had like a direct um, contact with certain types of food and they were, I think he was like organising actually catering for like companies for events and and they would do um renaissance style themed meals and or and other other stuff like this so that's why she had the idea of using that food and she uses salt a lot to signify humanity so i talked to her about that that was great yeah thank you and thanks to sam because she gave me the opportunity to do that i hadn't even heard of this great book yeah yeah <laughs> and also somebody's asking about the crows as well and the food in there and I mean that's an easy an easy ask of the author <laughs> yeah so I need to I'm still in the process of I have it and I haven't read it yet I've read the first bit which I really love so I'm not going to I'm going to leave that to afterwards because I thought it would be nice to, to write something about like a, a series of you know books or like the crows that uses it but I, I would need to obviously read it first <laughs> Because you, you might think, oh, it's always the same. It's not. Food changes very much. So depending on the location, the characters, what they what they want to to talk about, you know, what they want to say about themselves. So, and what they're hiding as well. And you have the feeling that Mel will have done a ton of research. So it will probably absolutely because I also got her other the history of um, the plate. I can't remember what it's called, Pagan on Sea or something. So I've, I'm, I'm on onto that. And there's a lot, you know, in the folklore as well and how things are used. So we've talked, we've talked about the change symbolism of coffee and any tea insights as well. Yeah. Tea is really interesting. Um, there's a book by Sydney Mintz called the sweetness of power or sweetness and power. Um, and he talks a lot about how tea changed the world basically, because, you know, you couldn't really drink water before but once you you kind of had tea to flavor it then it became part of the everyday and you know um it's just the meaning has changed over the over the years and the decades as well so you when you would have tea and even you know at what points during the day you would have tea so now people will have tea quite late in the evening um that wasn't a thing before so it's quite interesting to see why um the symbology changes and what it what it means um yeah yeah a lot of violence in these in these products a lot of um 
violence in sugar, in coffee, in tea, you know, they're coming from places that are, um, that are exporting to, 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 from colonies, you know, they're from colonies. So they are loaded with um, an idea that's very different from how they were produced in the conditions in which they were produced. So for me, there is a subtext to that as well. D blocks as a currency, yeah, definitely. Yeah, food in general. Absolutely, very violent, yeah. Um, the act of eating as well is quite violent, you know, if you think about it, even cutlery. <laughs> a rich character eats a great abundance of food every day that his appearance remains emaciated because the character symbolizes death person personified. So it's supposed to be that death doesn't change and <clears throat> that death takes and takes him. I've been thinking about approaches to food in my own stories because I think you can learn a lot about a character or the mood of a story based on how, what, why. Yes, definitely. Um, and I think you're right that um, even though we eat, you know, eating is nearly kind of a reminder of our own mortality. So we remain emaciated in the sense that we eat and we think, okay, this meal's done. For, but, you know, you need to eat again. It's a continual reminder of the fact that you're keeping yourself alive, but actually you're ever closer to, to death. Sorry to be, you know, a bit put a dampener on things, but so in a say, in a, it's a violence that kind of reminds us of, and that's why, you know, this book on meat is so good because it, it connects this kind of desire of um, wanting to fight away death with violence. We incorporate that to try and empower ourselves in a way. So that's what that symbology possibly can mean. And yes, you're right, that's a great, to, to do some research on food, I think, is a really good way to make a character well-rounded and coherent as well. Mm -hmm. Eating is such a chore. I think of a character definitely peeling an orange. Yes. And um, I watched a film the other day. It was, called, it was such a great film, Call Me By Your Name. And now that we mention fruit... Uh, no. <laughs> I'll say, peach. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> yes, Jill. Absolutely. Yes. We, um, also, Jill, this, this is interesting because there's like a layering of activity. So often we eat, but we also want to um, intensify our pleasure. Eating whilst watching TV, whilst listening to something, whilst reading. You know, it's not that you're eating and talking to someone else, but it's very much an, uh, becoming an individualistic activity that you carry out. Um, yeah. Mm. <laughs> we have a bit of everything in this group. What can I say? <laughs> History of coffee uh, was my problem. However, that accelerated the production. The horrible coffee was produced, but in mass, and the US being a top consumer explains how US coffee is consumed in a very watered down way. Yes. Yes, because it was awful quality. Yes. Yes. And it's a democratizing drink. You know, everyone can afford a coffee now. It wasn't the case before. I mean, before we used to, if we, I think people used to drink chocolate, hot chocolate, you know, in the morning. They didn't have, coffee wasn't in the horizon of what they had every day. So, yeah. There's some really interesting stuff about the advent of coffee shops in the 18th mm. century yeah um yes there's points of communication that's how i think papers started and the news yeah. the news yeah it's fascinating um just as a fun question for me have you read the thomas nash on vegetarianism from like the 16th century i haven't no i have to find it I found immediately i found it by this, this is totally like a research in process i'm, I'm at the very kind of beginning well, beginning for me it's been a couple of years but it's not been you know enough to do this uh incorporate everything that i'd love to yeah so nash yeah if you find it yeah he's he writes about all sorts of stuff but i found him because he does the theology of dreams and then just like as an added bonus he's like do you know why you have nightmares meat <laughs> yes <laughs> talks about a lot of the, his vegetarian as a sort of theology of vegetarianism i guess which is really interesting crossover yeah. Yeah. They often say cheese gives people bad dreams as well, doesn't it? Or cheese. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do people have any more questions for Ali? I feel like we've got a whole discussion going on in the chat. <laughs> I'm 
that I just interrupted. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, what was the first book you mentioned and showed us, Ali? The, the... Sorry, yep, the first book was uh, this one, it's called um, Much Depends on Dinner, Since Eve Ate Apples, Much Depends on Dinner, and it's by Margaret Visser. She writes a lot about the rituals of food, so why we use foods in certain ways and at certain times. Um, this is very interesting. It's this and Mary Douglas with her uh, book on natural symbols and um, this meat book as well on the symbology of meat were really have been really useful in this initial stage to just work out why certain foods are used and not others. You know. So I, I, I think you'll find them interesting as well. Hopefully when we put up some slides, I'll have the references done out properly. So I haven't done yet. Thank you. Cool. Any further questions or comments from anyone? The one about tea. Oh yes, you must with sweetness. This is a great book. Sweetness and power. This is not just, this is actually about sugar, but tea and sugar are connected completely. So people would heap their tea full of sugar. So it was, it came, you know, it was, and coffee, obviously. So Sweetness and Power by Sidney Mintz. And he talks a lot about the evolution of food um, and consumption generally. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you everyone for listening to me. That is great. About something fairly new. So, you know, I'm practicing myself on this topic. So it's, you know, um, let me put up the links again for Romancing the Gothic, which is what Ali's asked us to support today, which works well for me. <laughs> Thank you, Ali. Um, and also, let me just quickly, I forgot to get this up, but if you haven't signed up for next month yet, um, I do have the sign up sheet so that you can sign up for all of our exciting classes next week and off into the next month. Um, Next week, we're going to be uh, doing our Saturday lecture is uh, a shorter one uh, by Franz Potter, and he's going to be looking at all of the, the Gothic chat books. So if you don't know what the Gothic chat books were, they were the very sort of cheap, small uh, Gothic tales and, and shortened Gothic novels, which were sold to sort of a more working class audience in the late 18th, early 19th century, um, at the, a very ephemeral uh, in terms of, so a lot of them have been lost. Um, it's quite a work of reconstruction and research and sort of treasure hunting to find much about Gothic, uh, many Gothic chapbooks because they were produced en masse, you know, um, but were quite ephemeral, not poor quality, uh, used as all sorts of other things apart from books after their first life. Um, and then on the Sunday, we have talks by Lucy uh, Bayer Dutton about the Reluctant Widow movie, the Georgette Hare movie, The Reluctant Widow, um, that some of us watched um, and it is terrible, but talking about sort of that move to the screen adaptation of this sort of Gothic text to uh, the screen. Um, and then next week we're reading Elatsoe by uh, Dr. Darcy Little Badger and uh, they, she will be joining us again um, for to, uh, both meetings. So if come with your questions and thoughts and hopefully everyone will enjoy it. So yeah, do sign up for stuff. Um, do come along. Alexa is, I'm about halfway through. I know you finished Lynn's, um, so you're kind of ahead of the game, but I am very much enjoying it as well. It's very weirdly comforting. <laughs> I don't know, it feels like a hug of a book, maybe because it's so pretty um, as well. Like I have it in my hands and it's just a pleasure. Um, but yes. <laughs> So that's, I think that's all of the news. Um, obviously from next month, <coughs> if you're wanting to support the project, um, do have a look at the Patreon because um, what I'm hoping to do is to be able to make sure that everybody participating with a talk does get like a little bit of money from us. Just a, it'd just be 10 pounds at the moment, but um, I'm about a 10th of the way to that goal. So everybody's getting a pound at the moment. <laughs> nailed it <laughs> so yes um so if you do want to support the project think about supporting the patreon please to which i put the link higher up um yeah anywho 
thank you everyone for coming. Thank you so much to Ali. Um, and I will see Ali and some of you again, probably at seven. Um, so thank you for coming and thank you, Ali, and goodbye. Everyone. Thank you. Thanks everyone. See you soon. Bye.